It was the Vikings who, who came here a thousand years ago to what's now uh, not to uh, today's U.S., but to eastern uh, Canada and Newfoundland. Um, and Eric the Red uh, was really a fugitive. He was a, a killer, a, a, a mass murderer, really, who kept getting exiled and exiling himself until he reached Greenland. And then his children uh, launched off from there uh, across the Atlantic and were the first Europeans to, to explore and settle uh, what's now uh, North America. Um, they only hung around for about 15 years, but really it's, it's astonishing that they got here at all, um, uh, because at that time uh, most Europeans didn't sail out of the sight of their own continent, uh, yet the Vikings, uh, who were very intrepid, were sailing back and forth across the North Atlantic uh, uh, to Newfoundland um, until driven away, really, by, by the, the native people. Talking to us from Martha's Vineyard, and we point out it's Martha the daughter, not Martha the mother, <laughs> is, is Tony Horwitz, and we're rediscovering the new world with him. Let's jump jump ahead a bit. People have to buy the book to get all the, the lurid details. Uh, Christopher Columbus, his uh, commands, you suggest, as much print as any man in history, but you found him elusive. Yeah, I, what was interesting to me about uh, doing this book was even the the figures who uh, you know were familiar to me and I thought I knew something about, uh, like Columbus. It turned out that it really what we think we know is is ninety five percent myth and misconception. Uh, I was taught that you know he was this uh, sort of bold uh, uh, navigator and, and modern you know uh, man, early modern man, sort of battling medieval darkness, and everyone else thought the world was flat, etc. Uh, it turns out he was really a, a medieval mystic knight errant uh, who changed the world because he was so desperately wrong. He had a, a really deranged image of the world as, as, as very small. He thought he could sail west from Spain and, and reach Asia you know, in just a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, not only was he way off with the distance, uh, he also, of course, didn't know that there was a, a huge continent blocking his path. And what's astonishing about Columbus is he goes on, he has four voyages to America, and he goes all over the place, and the more he sees, the, the less he learns. He becomes more convinced as time goes on that he's, um, you know, reached um, the Far East when, in fact, he's sort of trolling, the, you know, the coast of Venezuela. Uh, Tony, so Tony, I know you've got a wonderful sense of humour, and I, I think the next thing I'm going to put to you sounds like a bit of a leg pull. I think, you, I think you're having us on here, Tony. You say that Columbus never actually set foot on the American continent or even saw or touched anything that later became U.S. soil. Yeah, Come continental... Clean. You continental made that U.S. Up. And when one Australian reviewer uh, took me to task for referring to the U.S. continent, by that I mean only the part of North America that's now now the U.S., the lower, what we call the lower 48 states, Columbus never never set foot on, on what's now the continental U.S. He landed first in the Bahamas and trolled around the Caribbean and later South and Central America, yet never, yet never came to U.S. shores. And uh, that's quite surprising, given given that we have a national holiday name for him in a, uh, about 30 cities and many institutions. We enshrined the man, and he never came here. I had images of him wandering through Texas, you know, past, right. the, past the book depository building. To put the right, or at Plymouth Rock. <laughs> yes. um, but uh, in fact, no, he, he, he never got here. And he, I mean, he is a significant figure. It's not doesn't diminish his uh, uh, significance, but it just makes it a bit odd that we've made him uh, um, a, some of a national hero and in, in recent years more of a national villain. But Tony, going back to his pottiness, he goes to his <laughs> deathbed still convinced he'd reached the Orient. It goes further than that. At one point, he even recants on the notion that the world is round. He thinks he's sailing uphill. So he, he as he writes it, he's, he's, he, the world is shaped like a breast. And at the t at top of the nipple is the Garden of Eden. And he thinks he's sailing <laughs> up the breast of the world, um, uh, you know, to, to paradise. Um, this is not the man I was taught about in school as the sort of first scientific thinker. Um, well, you know the Paul Keating echoes this view. He once described Australia as the arse end of the world. And so <laughs> yeah, right. it's, a, it's a prevailing view, you know, about br right. breasts and buttocks, I think. Right, and, and who was the pimple on the buttocks? <laughs> I don't remember what, what Keating... Uh, anyway, yeah, so, yeah, similar... Uh, he, he really was... Um, uh, but yeah, potty is a good word for it. <laughs> now, it wasn't until you embarked on this history, uh, this history re-education program, as you call it, that you realised how much of North America the Spanish had invaded, along with Mexico and Peru. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think most uh, Americans certainly associate the term conquistador with, with Cortez and the Aztec or, um, you know, the Inca in Peru and Pizarro conquering them. In fact, they also swept across um, what's now the U.S. Half of the states in the U.S. were uh, explored by the Spanish long before the first English arrived. And most astonishingly to me, not just uh, Florida and the Southwest and Texas, um, they even reached central Kansas. Um, in in the 1540s, which is, you know, again, uh, 80 years before the pilgrims get here, you have conquistadors riding horses into the, the middle of the plains. Uh, I should add, much to the surprise of plains Indians who have never seen horses before. Tony, uh, is there archaeological the evidence for this, or is it documented? Uh, is it... Bo- both. Um, uh, clearly documented and also uh, some archaeological finds. It's not, uh, there's some debate about the precise town they reached in what's now Kansas, but no no, uh, no debate about them having gone there. Um, so, you know, they covered a, an astonishing amount of ground and are really, uh, uh, you know, the European pioneers of this continent, yet again, are uh, not completely forgotten, but certainly their role is, um, uh, you know, uh, relegated to a fairly minor one in, in most histories. Is, is it this why you, uh, you put on the armor? Was it to celebrate this moment in, in American history? <laughs> not, not to celebrate it. I mean, most of these conquistadors by our lights today are not uh, anybody you want to celebrate. They were, they were killers. Um, but just to uh, get a sense, really, of uh, what that was like and, you know, also just to have some fun. Um, a lot of this book is, is not, you know, about the history per se. It's about how people remember it or forget it in the present. So... Uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, see what these reenactors were up to as well, and uh, you know. Well, they've got they've got a lot to live up to because you describe Coronado wearing a plumed helmet, gilded <laughs> armor, a force made up of Indians, Indian-equipped Spaniards, a small corps of metal-clad caballeros, civilians, black slaves, native servants, soldiers' wives, five friars, two painters, <laughs> five hundred and fifty horses, and innumerable livestock. This is quite a cavalcade. Yeah, this is, this is a major army that Coronado led uh, across from, from Mexico into, into what's now Arizona, 